<clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Classic Cast 15. We're here with Nano. We're here with Tips. We're here with Stay Safe. And uh, today we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, uh, namely the uh, the secret meeting that uh, that was had with uh, Nostalrius and Blizzard a few years ago, whenever Nostalrius got shut down. Uh, of course, real quick, Nano, for those of you guys who don't know, Nano is the head of quality assurance for Nostalrius. And uh, Nano, do you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself a little bit and, and tell us exactly what you did for Nostalrius? Yeah, uh, excited to be here on Classicast. So my name is Nano. Uh, I worked uh, as a part of the Nostalrius core team. My responsibility was leading the quality assurance team and helping to fix issues, bugs, confirm them, verify them, uh, and work on the new content that we were producing. All right. That's awesome. So could you tell us real quick, like a bit about Nostalris, what it was, this was, it shut down almost two and a half years ago we were just talking about. So yeah, what, yeah. what was Nostalrius? So Nostalrius was a group of people who came together and spent effort to make a, uh, make available the option of playing vanilla World of Warcraft for people who didn't have the opportunity to do that. So uh, when we, we started, or the server started um, all the way back like February of 15, which is like crazy how long ago it was, uh, and shut down about two and a half years ago. Um, and then a bunch of stuff has happened since then. There we go. Um, <clears throat> real quick, before we before we get too ahead, guys, last time on the last class cast, we did our very first class cast giveaway, uh, which is actually for three. BlizzCon virtual tickets, the classic cat, or not the classic cast, but the WoW Classic demo is attached to that. And to announce the winners, let's go ahead and do this. Uh, our winners are Ethug D, Misty Cow 711, and Mr. Ghost Lore. So I will be emailing you guys and make sure to check the emails that you guys registered with. So that we can get in touch as soon as possible, so that we can uh, so we can gift you guys those tickets. We will be doing another giveaway for three more virtual tickets, and the link to that will be in the comments on YouTube, and and we'll post that uh, a little bit later towards the end of the class cast. So it's it's not rigged, guys. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll we'll be doing another one. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll be we'll be doing a couple more actually. Um. <clears throat> so um. Let's, I mean, let's get into it, I guess. So this was, wh when exactly did you guys go meet with Blizzard? This was about two years ago, if not also shut down two and a half years ago. How, how soon after the shutdown did you guys go meet with Blizzard? So we shut down in April of 2018, and our meeting at Blizzard headquarters is like towards the end of June of 2018. So I think like a 26th, is, if my memory serves right. Right. That, so that June. You guys, you, one thing, one thing that differentiates you guys from other private servers is that you guys were sent a shutdown letter and you actually complied. You shut down willingly. You let everyone know. You give them notice, and then you you ceased. Uh, yeah, uh, pretty pretty much. Um, so, uh, we'll we'll probably talk a lot more about the meeting. But one thing that was said uh, during the meeting um, was we were trying to figure out like how Blizzard's going to make classic wow happened and one of the options that was on the table at that time was could blizzard license the name of world of warcraft and let somebody else run the server in the same way that everquest and sony did with the p99 private server where they were officially licensed as like the original everquest place to play um so one of the options was available was maybe Blizzard would do that with Nostalrius. And basically they're lawyers and they did the research and they said, no, we can't do that. Um, and so one thing I said at the meeting was, hey guys, you know, it, people want to play this content. They want to play it. And they were given the opportunity to play it at a place of Nostalrius where we were in it for no profit. We were in it just for the love of the game and for, you know, providing a place for the community to play. Uh, but there's other servers that do exist that are for profit that only exist to right. use your your copyright and your IP to make money for themselves. So if you shut us down, then people have no legitimate options to go and play the game. And one thing that Jay Allen said in response to that was, well, you know, you you never seen any other private server come and sit here in the blizzard. And you guys were invited. Mm -hmm. So Jay Allen uh, said that you said, yeah, yeah. Brax at that. Yeah. 
how supportive would you say he was of uh, Classic WoW? Seeing as he's now the president of Blizzard now, I think people would want to hear uh, how much he, he likes the idea, you know? Right. So, like, the public's uh, interaction with J. Allen Brack is, is limited basically to when they see him show up in videos or at BlizzCon. And the clip that they've seen of J. Allen Brack saying, you think you do, but you don't, at BlizzCon is like something that he regrets at this point and not just because of uh the reaction that he's received but he generally thinks that he was submissive of people and their opinions the jay allen that i met at the blizzard meeting and again i don't know the guy personally other outside of like the five hour meeting that we had um but he was genuine and attentive and cared about what we had to say um and a true uh he, he loves world of warcraft um and um, yeah, I, I I'm not scared that classic is going to be canceled <laughs> because Jay Allen Brack is now the president of Blizzard Entertainment. First of all, he has much more important things to care about at this point uh, than the development for Classic WoW. But also, um, I think that he uh, has fully embraced Classic WoW, and um, you know, he was the one that announced it at BlizzCon mm -hmm. last year. So, uh, and I think that was probably really important for him to do. There's a lot of people who could have announced it. It could have been Mike Morheim. It could have been Ian. But Jay Allen was the one that announced it. And I think it was, he really wanted to embrace that and be the one that announced it uh, to the community. Right. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's great. Who, who, would you say, who would you say was probably the most supportive of the prospect of legacy servers in, in that meeting? Uh, probably Ian, actually. Uh, so Ian Hoskost is the game director for World of Warcraft. Um, I say that because he was the most engaged through the whole process. He was leaning forward in his chair, asking good questions, giving feedback uh, for things that we were saying. Um, so he was the one that really uh, was the most attentive to, to what we were saying and, and giving us the most feedback. And, and it makes sense. So Ian, if people don't know, his history with World of Warcraft is that he was a hardcore raider in vanilla. Um, even some of the, the uh, work on Cthune that we did was based on comments that he had back in 2005, talking about health pools for tentacles and and basically doing the math how pre-nerf Cthune was mathematically impossible, which I don't think it actually is because players are much more capable of DPS these days than they were back then. But we actually used some of his comments in our research for developing Cthune at the time. So that's pretty interesting. That's awesome. And I totally believe that. I was going to say, you and I, we sat there and we watched Ian give an hour-long speech talking about, you know, his how he got into gaming and how he ended up working for Blizzard. And he spent about 15 or 20 minutes of his hour-long speech talking about Vanilla WoW and how raid leading in Vanilla WoW and working through these encounters actually helped him with his professional career. He, you could tell watching, listening to him speak about Vanilla WoW, he genuinely loves it. Yeah, ab absolutely. So uh, that, and so he was a hardcore raid in Vanilla and joins the team in, in Burning Crusade. Uh, so like one memorable moment was I was presenting about um, our server quality um, and talking about the raids specifically and got to the point where we talked about Anixia um, and talked about uh, the deep breath ability from Anixia, which is famously nobody knows exactly how deep breath is, uh, for Anixia. And so they actually asked us the question, Ian asked us the question, by the way, how did you guys you know, script deep breath to work on Anixia? Because he was curious at how we were going to reproduce that. Um, so the short answer basically is like, Every time Anixia flies and changes positions in phase two, it rolls a number. If it rolls a certain number, then she deep breaths. And if not, then she, she doesn't. That's the long and short of it. Um, and so then I asked, like, is that how it's supposed to work? Uh, to which they said, no, that's not how, <laughs> that's not how it works. <laughs> um, and uh, then I asked, well, are you going to tell us how it works then? And they said, no, we're not going to uh... tell you how it works. Um, but Ian said the first thing that he did when he got the job was look up exactly how Anixia's deep breath worked. Really? Is... Wow. See, I think that's so interesting because that brings up the... We talk about this all the time with like how private servers are scripted and, and stuff like this. Like For, for you guys, whenever you guys did Nostalrius, um, your, your main goal, your main goal was basically to show that there was support for, uh, for Classic, right? The, the prospect of doing legacy servers. Um, 
you guys went back and did, did you guys just go through and, and basically use a bunch of research to kind of try and mix and match stuff and just from from what people's knowledge was and like thinking back then what uh yeah. what it would be yeah there's a number of parts to our presentation and one of those parts was um basically you might call it market research um so we had a number of statistics about players how much they played what their average play time was how many what percentage of the population like if you reached level 10 how likely were you to reach level 60 those kind of things um, and we also had done a, a pretty large survey which we got a lot of feedback for uh, after it came down and after we announced we were going to blizzard in order to receive even more specific feedback for, for certain things and we presented the, the survey responses uh, to blizzard as as part of that that area uh, of the presentation so what is that number? What is that number if you're if you if you reach level oh, ten? Man. I don't know. I'm you don't sorry. Remember. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Do you remember think, what the biggest Ithlian level was drop that, off was? Uh, I think Ithlian was the one that presented all that, and I don't, I I haven't looked at the numbers since he presented them, so I I'm sorry, I don't know. No problem. No problem. You don't remember like uh, which is like the biggest level range where there's the biggest drop off or anything like that? Well, the biggest drop off is like level one to 10, but that's just because there's a billion level one alts that are made for banking characters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, if you remove like the outlier of level one, most players reached like level 25. So like people were playing to, to about the mid-level time. Um, but again, that can account for a ton of people's alts where they just like, hey, I feel like leveling a hunter because they want to make another profession or something like that and they you know right. give up halfway through yeah. so you, it, it's hard to, to nail down exactly like the unique number of players um because we don't have full control over all of that um but we we have some idea right you get wrecked in hills brad and you're just like gg dude i'm done dude <laughs> yeah these yetis will not drop their heights and i'm, I'm just done yeah, uh, I think I think that's happened. I, I think that's happened to all of us at some point where we go to level another character and then just kind of, eh, <laughs> like kind of fizzles out. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of like oh, I'm gonna work on my own guy. Um, I do. I, I do want to talk a little bit more about uh, about the meeting. How how did the meeting exactly kind of happen? I mean, you guys were kind of kind of the the timeline of events and and just kind of like how how things went from even before the shutdown to the meeting. Uh, I'm, I'm still really curious about that, exactly how everything went down and what your guys' thoughts were on the entire thing. Like, how, how did you guys feel and all that? Yeah. Um, so shortly after we shut down, we launched the uh, change.org petition, uh, which is, at this point is, is pretty famous. Um, got hundreds of thousands of signatures on that. And that was a letter to Mike Morheim, um, basically advocating for Classic WoW to be available players to play um through that process a number of, you know people got together and generating uh, buzz about it and we were also trying to reach out uh personally to a number of different uh, people at blizzard so mike morheim and jay allen and ian and, and tom chilton and trying to like get in contact with them and eventually we we're reached out to by their international pr director to set up a time for all of us to fly out to, to blizzard to to do the meeting so the actual um initiation for the meeting uh, came from their side were you guys worried that the meeting was a trap or that you were in trouble or something <laughs> was that a thought that crossed your mind um no because they bought our plane tickets so oh, okay have you been a pretty big uh, investment on their part to to honeypot us in that way, I guess. Um, but I know that was a popular refrain on some people that you're kind of walking <laughs> walk into a red wedding situation. That's <laughs> so, I mean, what what was that like? I mean, you you you're here. You're working on this this game, right? That was you know made by Blizzard. You're working on this game that was made by Blizzard. Uh, you were basically providing a service in order to the end goal being like to, to show that there's support for this. And then they finally fly you out there and you get to step into Blizzard headquarters for the first time. You're talking to Mike Morheim, Jalen Brack, Ian Hazakustis, Tom Chilton, and, and who else? 
Um, so in the room, Mike Morheim, uh, a couple of their community managers, uh, Tom Chilton, uh, Ian Hazakostas, a couple PR people, uh, Jay Allen and Marco, who is their technical director. And uh, just, but, um, what was that like? I mean, you're obviously, you're a big fan of the game. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, was, it was surreal. Uh, it's crazy because, you know, I've been playing Blizzard games since I was like, I don't know, when did Warcraft 2 Orcs and Humans come out? Yeah. Uh, Starcraft come out? Um, uh, the original Diablo. So I, I played like basically every Blizzard game since Warcraft 2. Um, and so the the legacy of, of Blizzard, Blizzard being one, my favorite video game production company, uh, to be able to be on their headquarters and like nerd out during like the tour of the whole uh, facility that that was really cool and then to to sit in their boardroom and overlook the quad with the the orc statue and you know that was crazy and then but you have to like put your your game face on pretty quickly because you're going to be talking to a bunch of people who are really important <laughs> um like mark Mo mike morheim I, he just re retired um but like he is a staple in the video game production world and mm -hmm. even in the business world like activision blizzard is a it's a multi multi-billion dollar international company so like and, and he's a large part of that so uh you have to like put that aside because we're there to do a job uh to you know really you know do our best to pres to put the best foot forward for for classic wow and so it was cool being there and then i really felt the weight of it after we left because while we were even doing the tour it's like okay we have this you know, really important thing that's coming up that that you have to stay focused on yeah so so you actually you sent me uh, a bunch of pictures let's go ahead and look at those actually now that we're yeah. now that we're on the topic but um yeah, some of these were really cool i thought this was really cool uh, a lot of these pictures yeah. here um, yeah, so I, I kind of have the pictures in two sections. One is kind of like the art and statues around Blizzard headquarters, and then the other one's like a little personal. That that mural right there is just incredible. Like, yeah, the Kerrigan. The oh Kerrigan one is my favorite, by the way. Yeah, yeah. it looks so good, so yeah. detailed. Yeah, the Kerrigan one's great. Um, my favorite was that that Witch King mural because it it spans an entire like hallway, like yeah. that is like floor to ceiling a whole hallway of the witch king and ice crown that's incredible, incredible. yeah yeah the dark uh, that portal one too here is really cool uh, a mixture of uh, starry night and the uh, dark portal that's awesome yeah. that looks so good yeah so the level of detail in these is, is just incredible to me yeah it's pretty sweet and, and that one obviously you have to you have the to original <laughs> yes <laughs> the original dude that's awesome it's not, it's not that impressive but oh that's yeah. the original really yeah the, the well the original uh load screen like the default screen. Uh, yeah but is that the original but, rendition of it was it a painting before oh, I, made? I don't know um but that's the load oh, okay. screen you get where the game doesn't realize where you're supposed to be Right, or if exactly. you get ported to GM Island or something like that, that's the that's the load screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So maybe some people in the chat are really familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and these are the uh, kind of the yes, more, the more personal are, pictures. These are the attendees. Uh, uh, and I guess you could guess which one I am at this point. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's great. Look at like, this is so interesting. I mean, b before Ian Hazakosis was game director, um, it was Brack. More high. Like, oh. this, this is so cool to me. There's Asmongold next to the lady on the right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the craziest thing is that Tom Chilton, who was the game director for the largest MMO in the world, it comes to work with a t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops. It's like <laughs> quite the culture. <laughs> Wish I could do that. Yeah. Every... This is great. This is you guys. This is the team. This is the NOS this team. This is the, the NOS core team. Correct. There you go. There's the yeah. guys, dude. There's our guys. Yeah. The iconic statue in the background there. Uh, this is um, a set of the goodies that we walked away with uh, from our meeting. So uh, a quick aside on that um, Overwatch glass. Um, Overwatch had just been released in 2016, and at Blizzard they celebrate every game release with a champagne toast where everybody at the company comes out during lunch and does a toast on the quad to the new game. And we happened to be there during the Overwatch <laughs> toast. 
<laughs> so we all walked away with uh, champagne glasses uh, that were branded with Overwatch stuff. That's, really funny. that's, that's so awesome. cool. We're probably the only five people in the wor in the world that aren't Blizzard employees that have them. Yeah. <laughs> and this this uh, is on your wall right now, isn't it? Yeah. It, when we get back to me, we'll uh, we'll uh, you'll see it behind me. But it's signed by the the attendees of the meeting, Tom uh, Chilton, you can see there, and uh, Mike Ian? Morheim's at the bottom right, and Ian and um, Jay on Brack is right next to the the Night Elf on the edge, or yeah. coming out of the dwarf's gun, I should say. Oh yeah, right there. That's great. Yeah. That's so cool. All this is so like just it blows my mind. Mm -hmm. This is the board. A uh, good picture of the the boardroom. Yeah. So this uh, is where it happened. This, this was this is where the magic happened. Yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> this is pre meeting when we were still super worried and setting up and eating lunch. All the wow. different time zone clocks there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right here. Oh, so the fourth fourth of June. Sorry, not the twenty sixth. Fourth of June, two thousand sixteen. Been that's all so years. cool yeah. so i have a question for you what do you think like how effective was nostalgia what do you think nostalgia's role was in instigating classic wow or convincing them what do you think your effect was so nostalgia was by far the largest uh server of its kind uh, at, at that time and with an international team that was successful with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of players consistently playing on it. I think that was kind of an uh, an awakening moment for those who aren't familiar with that scene. Because previously you had private servers that were like fun servers with high rate leveling or high rate drops and or even just like a thousand players or a hundred players going on concurrently. But when you start approaching 12,000 players concurrently, it's hard to ignore that uh, from a game perspective. There's probably MMOs out there that are live right now that would wish that they had 12,000 players concurrently playing their game that are like n names of yeah. MMOs yeah. that we would know these yeah. days. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that we had that level of population consistently playing and it grew over time, it kind of proved that it wasn't just a, like a put on your rose tinted glasses and enjoy something for a little bit, but people were investing the time in what we were doing. So it was really um, kind of putting a flag in the ground. It's like, hey, we exist and we matter and uh, you should pay attention to us. Yeah. So speaking of rose tinted glasses, do you, I don't know if you have any idea of this or any metric. Do you know, if you had to guess, how many people were playing on Astellarius that had never played Vanilla WoW retail back in the day? It was their first time they heard about it. They wanted to see the origins. Do you have any idea? Um, the best idea I could really give was my player experience and having communication with people within my guild. Um, there's no way for us to know if people played uh, Vanilla. Um, I believe in the survey, it was something like 30% of players had never played Vanilla WoW before. Like, mm. this was their first experience, if I remember the That's numbers right. Number. That's a big number. Um, but most of the people in my guild, and I was in a, uh, in a raiding guild, um, which you know pushed content, so most likely you're going to attract people who had some experience to the game before. Uh, but there were still a, a handful of people who had never played Vanilla WoW before that were a, a part of my guild. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't like one or two percent. It was a significant portion of the population. Wow. Do you think that'll extend into retail classic? I mean, how if you were to take a guess, what would be the distribution between? Old time vanilla players and brand new players that have never played vanilla after like three months of classic launch. Some of it will probably depend on how what the business model is for Classic WoW. Um, if they include Classic with the regular retail WoW sub that people have now, that's going to encourage a lot of people to at least try it. Um, the better question might be like how many people who have never played Vanilla WoW get to level 60 and are participating in the end game content. Uh, and it's hard to guess what that will be, um, but I would estimate it's probably gonna be similar to Nostalgia. I know a number of people who I played with back in Vanilla who never touched uh, any Nostalgia or any other server that's ever existed um, because of the, you know, the questionable nature of it, um, which is fair. Um, but they're really excited for Classic WoW to come out. Uh, there's sure. some people that didn't touch it because they were 
uh, they wouldn't be assured that their character would stay forever because uh, the other thing with private servers is that they come and go pretty frequently. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to invest the time into a, in a place where their progress wouldn't be saved in some way. Um, Absolutely. So they've been, they've for been sure. waiting for, for Blizzard to do this right in order to go back into the content that they've, they've loved. Definitely. I think you raise a good point. I mean, the people that are playing on private servers like Nostalgia's or, or other ones, these are people that are that they've accepted the fact that their server, that their player, their 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 character could be deleted at any moment. You know, they've reconciled the fact that this is a sort of a bootleg version of Vanilla WoW. I think right. that, and, and as such, only the most hardcore, you know, fans are willing to play the game under the circumstances. I think with Classic WoW, the accessibility will be so much more. It'll be, it'll be opened up so much. You'll have a ton of new blood coming in and playing the game, and that's great. Yeah. yeah, I think that those players who are have been playing retail um, for a while and haven't thought about going back to the old game, they really are like two different games at this point. Mm -hmm. Like the current version of of WoW and Classic WoW, they are called the same thing by title only. Really, at this point, like people are going to go back and find just so much slower pace to progress. Like obviously, leveling leveling is much much slower. The way that you gear up your character is much, much slower. The way even like getting to dungeons to do a dungeon and getting the group together is so much slower. Um, but that slowness is a re like for me, I personally like that. I like the slow progression of earning your gear. I, I like that we have a 40 man raid. Uh, and if you're lucky, you'll walk away with a piece of loot, like a, like a good piece of loot, like every four weeks where the expectation is you go into a raid now and you get upset if you haven't seen a personal loot drop in like three bosses. Um, so that kind of pace is really going to throw a lot of people off. Um, but I'm convinced that one, I think, I think BFA is, is an excellent game and I've enjoyed playing it personally. Um, and to Legion before that, uh, but when people go and play Classic WoW, if they put the real effort into it and not just dismiss it out of hands, they're going to find that the the slowed down pace of the game causes you the option and the ability to build deep relationships with people, uh, that you get invested in a guild, that you really require them to do any real progression in the game. And that sense of bond and community that comes from Vanilla WoW is unlike what you can experience in the game today, at least in my personal experience. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And, and you said you were, we, we were talking before the show for a little bit. You said you're currently playing BFA. Yep. Yeah. Currently playing BFA, playing a, playing a demon hunter um, in a relatively casual guild. We're pushing heroic progression right now. Mm -hmm. See, that's why you're having fun because you're playing a demon hunter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's a fun class. Uh, I enjoy it. it. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So, so what you said a moment ago sort of hits on something. I this is the reason I think Vanilla WoW is so successful. But I want to know, in your words, why do you think this 15-year-old game has had so much longevity and desire and a constant, never-ending community backing it up and making content and, and and promoting it? Why do you think it's stuck around? Out of all the games from that era that that have come and gone, why Vanilla WoW? Do you think why why is that one so popular? Great. That's a great question. So really it's it's an engaging game and it is time consuming so you do have to spend effort on making progression happen for your character and that time investment causes emotional investment as well so every moment that you spend on a specific character causes you to emotionally tie to it all the more and when you have to like if you want to make real progression at the end game you need a 40 man raiding guild and every raid every opportunity to do a dungeon with that group of people gives you even more like gives you an emotional tie-in to that community that you've built so by the pure fact that the game is how it is it requires you to build deep relationships with people like i still have deep relationships and playing i'm playing bfa today and the core of our, our group is the core of our vanilla raiding guild from 2005. That's so cool. And so that sense of community that was developed is really the driving force, I think, because people play this game and, you know, the, the difficulty of your DPS rotations, and I'll use quotes because unless you're like, uh, I don't know, even 
even a warrior or a rogue have some sense of rotations. But if you're a frost mage, you don't have a rotation. You press frost bolt. Um, so like people don't play vanilla WoW for the difficulty of the DPS rotation, but they play it for the difficulty and the character progression, mm -hmm. and the difficulty in keeping the 40 people that you've made emotional ties with together. And that skill, that combination of things, has um, made the game cemented in people's hearts and minds and in our culture as a whole mm -hmm. so I, I i think those those kind of things have have helped it outlive a number of other games that have that have come out since that time for sure absolutely and like the thing that like rings so true like or something that you didn't say i guess i should say none of what you said has to do with actual content or actual you know like the combat system or anything like that it's funny, you know, a lot of, I see a lot of companies, especially a lot of MMO developers today, market their games on the basis of, oh, we're introducing like an action combat system, or, oh, we have all of this great, you know, outdoor content and stuff like that. It seems like content is actually, you know, it serves more as a supplement to the actual game system and the philosophies of the game. And really, if the philosophies aren't right, it doesn't matter what content you add into the game, it doesn't matter what combat system you add into the game. Right. If you don't have the fundamentals correct, it just it doesn't matter. The game doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, so, like, if you take for example, like the the current uh, main complaints about BFA, it's not about the raid content. It's not about the PvP content. It's not about like the core like part of the gameplay, but it's the systems that are around it that give you the progression. So the Azerite power stuff, for instance, is the number one biggest complaint that people have with mm -hmm. BFA. Um, and that is a stumbling block to people enjoying the content that they do enjoy in the game. Um, and I, there are stumbling blocks that happen in Vanilla WoW for different people. Um, some of it is just that it takes forever to get to level 60. Um, and it just and you can't pull six mobs at a time unless you're like i don't unless you're a frost mage and you're blizzarding everything down but if you're a warrior and you pull two mobs that are plus two levels from you you're most likely going to die and that's going to uh, that's just the difference in in the game between uh vanilla and bfa are are what it is um but but you're right like the systems of vanilla encourage people to be in community that there's really no options for you to progress. Uh, you can't really collect tier two gear unless you're in a group of community. Even like the pug groups that happen, it's like the same group of people who are running on their alts in the pug group every week uh, to get tier two. So that kind of stuff is uh, is important and built into vanilla. Right. Yeah, I think you guys are both very right. I think content a lot of times has, or almost every time has, very limited replayability. Like, imagine trying to do in Taurus for the next 10 years. You would hate it, you know, within a couple months, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but Vanilla WoW, it in incentivizes and encourages and fosters so much involvement with community and interaction. And that sort of stuff has limitless replayability because it's always different every time you do it. There's always new people to, to talk to and chat with. I think you're both are very right. Okay, so sorry, just to kind of continue, um, a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier you mentioned how 30% of the player base, uh, or sorry, 30% of the people who put in uh, signatures for the prospect of legacy servers that, that was sent into Blizzard, um, they, they hadn't even played vanilla before. I think uh, something that we had talked about, we've actually, I, I think we've brought this up uh, a couple times before on Classic Cast, but so many of the people... 30% uh, is a, a fairly significant number, I would say, of people that have never even touched vanilla, still interested in playing. And I think it's because they want to go back and uh, get the opportunity to experience what they missed. Or there's there's even a percentage of people who want to go back and finish what they missed. What, I mean, what do you really think about that? Um, yeah, I think that there's a big pull for not a lot of people ended up killing KT when they played mm -hmm. uh, vanilla. And and that was a big pull for me playing on the Solaris was, you know, I, I had a, a hole in completing quote unquote vanilla WoW. Um, and I wanted to experience that content, which I never did originally. I, I my guild broke up, um, when we were moving towards Gothic. So never got Gothic down, never got four horsemen down, never got, um, never got Saffir, um, 
or KT down. Mm -hmm. So that I wanted to do those. That I wanted to do that, and um, that was something that was a pull for me and a number of people in my guild. But my guild is just a, a subset of the people who enjoy Vanilla WoW. There's a ton of people who play the game just for the leveling content, who just want to, you know, go in the world and do quests and experience it and go explore. And some people want to just do a guild building where they like mm -hmm. become a guild leader and they just get the biggest community that they can and encourage people to do dungeons with one another and some of the most fun that i have in the game is like leveling dungeons with a group of five people we just you know let's just go out of our way and go to shadowfang keep when we're alliance we're gonna make the our trek all the way over there and we're gonna do the instance and it's gonna be fun uh and some of that content's the the most fun that i have it's like we're on an adventure together we're gonna go do this uh, the content is challenging even at a low level uh, those low level dungeons are sometimes more challenging than Molten Core is at max level. Like, how, how many people here have died more in Nomergon at level 30 than they have in Molten Core <laughs> at level 60? Yeah, that that recently, last hallway, right? man. Yeah, that yeah. last hallway, dude. Yeah. Like... So, th those kind of content uh, where it's difficult and it, um, from level 1 all the way to level 60. They don't need to get to level 60 and max level and like push for rank 14 to enjoy the game. So um, there's there's a lot of people that enjoy Vanilla WoW and it's a large enough sandbox that you can have all kinds of different people enjoy it for what it is. For sure, for sure. So <clears throat> obviously you guys, whenever you guys flew out to Blizzard, you guys were talking to them, you were having a uh, you're, you're basically presenting everything that you guys had learned that you thought would be, uh, I guess, beneficial to them and maybe, you know, pushing like the, the prospect of doing legacy servers in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we talked a little bit about this beforehand and, and Stacey have actually brought this up, but uh, actually Stacey, do you want to go ahead and ask a question? Uh, you can take it, dude. Okay. So basically Stacey was talking about um, how... Like, like, how instrumental do you think it was uh, what you guys did and what you guys showed uh, in order to kind of give them, give them kind of a sense of confidence about the potential of doing legacy servers? Yeah. So doing legacy content like this is obviously was not a new idea, even when we went to Blizzard headquarters. Um, the been a frequent question at every BlizzCon. Uh, culminating in the you think you do but you don't famous quote and that originated from somebody asking like have you ever thought about making content for the different expansions as they were at the time they were released um so it wasn't a new idea to blizzard and surely they've had some conversations about it before we had the meeting like does this make sense from a business perspective? What effort will we need to put in to make this happen? I will give them the benefit of the doubt that they've had those conversations just because they are a business and they're always looking mm -hmm. for different ways to diversify and to have different revenue streams. Um, and I think that there was a, a community turning point that um, at the time as well, when you have to consider the context of where we're at, Legion was in beta Warlords of Draena was on its last leg. Most people would agree that Warlords was one of the weakest, if not the weakest, WoW expansion that existed. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I say it was the weakest. It had the least amount of content um, and did the most to uh, isolate the individual players from the rest of the community with garrisons. Mm -hmm. And so through that process, a lot of people were yearning for like, remember when we used to have 40 people in a raid. I wonder right. what that was like. And it drove people to want to experience that content. So in the context of all of that, Nostalarius comes up. We are really successful in what we were doing. We have the meeting with Blizzard. And I think that it was uh, an opportunity for Blizzard to open their eyes to the larger community that we had proved that it wasn't just a flash in the pan, rose tinted glasses thing but it had real legs to it. And then they just needed to figure out how they did it mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. Also, uh, also a key point, I think, thrown in during WAD, was it WoW's 13th anniversary where they actually had the 40-man 
molten core raid that people could do right for the mm -hmm. for this for the celebration and people were like oh this is kind of fun it's kind of challenging gar you know we actually have to do some mechanics we can wipe right. on this boss <laughs> yeah and the uh south shore versus torn mill uh events yeah right yeah happened then too yeah which I, is kind of weird but it was fun yeah i think it's interesting kind of the combination of uh, a weak point in the the history of wow in addition to to nostalgius nostalgius being like one of the more uh, you know, you're doing progressive vanilla, you're doing progressive itemization, uh, progressive content release, and mm -hmm. trying to go for, for the most Blizz-like is, is the term a lot of people throw around, most Blizz-like experience. Mm -hmm. um, kind of turned out to be the perfect storm for the popularity of the server and the popularity of the movement, I would say, for um, for legacy servers. Yeah? Right. Yeah. So, I, I think so. I So the, the context was right. Um, like the environment soil had been uh, enriched to the point where this could, this idea could be planted and, and actually grow. So and part grew. of it, part, yeah, it grew. Um, I, it's obvious to some degree, whatever, whatever degree it actually is. I think it's um, to some degree, Nasarius made it different um, and pushed this to the forefront. Um, I think the real real the real thing that mattered the most was the petition because it wasn't just a group of people playing on a server but so many different unique names people who loved the loved wow for a long time coming out in favor of it having people of influence youtubers and streamers and mark kern and, and others who helped take up the mantle i think that whole movement of it is what initiated the meeting uh, that allowed us the opportunity to present to Blizzard. And that was the real driving force behind them realizing like, okay, can we just continue, can we continue to ignore this? And I think that they landed at the answer is no, we can't continue to ignore this. This is something that so many people want that will bring people back into the World of Warcraft community that have left for whatever reason along the way. Mm -hmm. So, and, and now where we are now, so that <laughs> we're uh, crazy in a month. Like we're going to be playing classic wild demo at home. Uh, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Yeah. How, how much, how much of an emphasis, one of you guys are presenting, how much, of, how much do you guys emphasize the, the concept of, cause this is a big question that's coming up and we all, all three of us feel this way where if they don't have progressive item release, they don't have or progressive itemization, progressive content release, um, that, and, and maybe not itemization to, to as much of an extent, but especially raid content release that the game is going to suffer pretty pretty badly but they haven't really come out and said anything specifically uh on what they plan on doing on that front how how big of an how, how much did you guys emphasize how big of a deal that was for nos specifically we talked about it um nos was the first server that attempted to do progressive itemization mm -hmm. and i say attempted to because we were far from perfect and it, it's probably probably impossible for us to be 100 percent perfect because right. things are lost to time right um but uh, I think progressive content release is a absolute must. Like releasing Nax at the outset of the of the release is basically saying that the server's DOA in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Yeah. And I don't think they'll ever do that either. These are MMO veterans. They understand the idea of releasing content and drip by drip, so people experience this, and then they move on to the next thing. It's it's all about carrots on a stick for mmos and they they understand that um so they um i don't think that they'll ever consider that idea now what they might do is really something like soul Garub earlier than how they'd had it or other like battlegrounds and honor systems and that's a whole different conversation that we can get into if we want but uh the itemization i think is it's not the, as important but it's pretty close to it right um the, the reasoning being is that the items, the items that were added later in the game were added to the game at the point where they made sense. Mm -hmm. So right. items that were added to the five-man dungeons in 1.10 with the revamp of itemization for those dungeons added gear that was significantly more powerful than gear that you would find in Molten. Right. Now, if you allowed those items to exist when only Molten Core exists as content, then you're basically invalidating a number of the items that you that you want to get from from the raid, and 
to be frank, a lot of the items you get from Encore aren't very good anyway, but to lower that small number even more is will feel bad for the majority of people. So yeah. um, I'm not sure how they're going to do itemization. I hope that they, um, they embrace the idea of itemization, uh, like patch progression mm -hmm. itemization. Now, there's things that you can talk about that that don't matter as much to add earlier, like um, cloth donations for rep for the cities. Like, there's probably nothing wrong with adding that earlier. Um, right. Questions to do with um, quest with hubs. What do you think about that? Quest hubs probably doesn't matter either, as long as they don't involve. Like, I wouldn't add, like, the max level quest right. hub in Light's Hope Chapel with the donations for, like, the Flores and the Dark Iron Scraps and that kind of stuff because they, it, the reason for those is for items that you get from the the quest vendor for the turn-ins. But, like, Searing Gorge quests, level 40 quest zones, uh, they added them for a reason, and it's because that there is, there's a gap there that's mm -hmm. missing for players and their leveling content. So uh, the level 50 uh, sunken temple quests, I don't see too much of a reason why you hold those back. There are yeah. some items that are better than other pre-raid items. Um, I think that the hunter, right? Get. The hunter quest, namely? The, 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 sh the warlock quest has a pretty decent wow. weapon and some the, options. The staff, too. yeah. Um, there's a number of options, but they're not like out of line with other content that you couldn't get from like dire mall right. so that those are questions that you probably have to figure out um but uh, i think that those are okay because it doesn't impact the in game balance uh to to a level right so, so yeah. well since we're on the topic uh on nos on basically like with, with the nos core there's a number of kind of like small little custom adjustments and stuff that you guys made kind of along the lines of what you're talking about like you know adding the searing gorge quest and stuff like that um there's been a lot of talk that you know when you know we we all say like no changes but it's it's got like quotes around it a little bit because we're not 100 percent sure you know when nobody's really 100 percent sure other than maybe blizzard like what exactly happened when and what exactly is no changes so for a lot of people it's like well, what is what, no change blizzard might do? not know either just saying <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> so yeah um a lot, for a lot of people like for me i feel like no changes is anything between like 1.11 and 1.12 uh just kind of anything that happened in between but uh what are what are some of the things that you guys did on on nost that were different from the actual like release of the game uh on purpose maybe like putting something in at the beginning uh so something that we did intentionally for the raid content is that we always pursued the pre nerf versions of the content regardless mm -hmm. of what patch it was uh that was basically not i shouldn't say pre nerf i should say the hardest version of the boss mm -hmm. okay um regardless of what patch that was so for instance anixia changes uh patch 1.3 um specifically her phase two bless you stay safe um, <laughs> thank you sorry <laughs> um Specifically, 1.3 changes the fireballs that she has in phase two. Um, so she targets one person and does an AOE conflict effect to anyone around them prior to 1.3. And then one, after that, they, she changes to shooting three fireballs that just do blanket damage. We felt that the, the version of doing the conflagration was harder, and therefore we maintained that version uh, moving forward. Um, now it doesn't extend to everything because we didn't actually release AQ40 on NOST, but we intended to not make tentacles spawn in the walls on Cthulhu, <laughs> which we felt was, uh, which technically is the hardest version of that boss, but we felt was a uh, like uh, a lose condition was, basically. <laughs> yeah, it was it was more of a bug uh, and an unintended effect than it was um, something that you would consider pre-nerf. Right. So. Those kind of things we we avoided. Um, so, if they were if if they can, were considered bugs, then we did not reproduce them. Right. If they were considered harder versions uh, or pre-nerf, then we tried to implement them as best as we could. 
Right. So did you do this because of uh, having 1.12 talents all the way through? Was it, would that have anything to do with it? Uh, yeah. So we wanted to make the content challenging as best as we could without manually going and actually adjusting uh, like damage numbers and HP numbers. So par part of my philosophy was it with it was is that previous private servers that had released raid content had not released ra raid content that was the most accurate version of them. So they were missing abilities. They weren't scripted correctly. They were doing abilities to uh, like too infrequently where they didn't end up mattering um, or armor values were off or resistance values were off and a number of those things. So our goal was, or my goal was to make sure that the raids were as close to perfect as possible and then see how the community had difficulties with that. And I will obviously say that we were not perfect. There's a number of things they came to learn after NOS had shut down that we had incorrect that like made me sad. Uh, <laughs> I think what I mentioned before was like Fire Maw's Flame Buffet where he does the AOE pulsing uh, uh, increasing debuff that makes mm -hmm. you take more fire damage that does fire damage itself. Uh, we had it set to happen every 10 seconds. It's supposed to happen, happen every 5 seconds. And I found it oh, out okay. after... Right. After NOS closed down, because uh, I found a video that uh, you could, that was, oh, oh, yeah, anyway. I have found a video that was synced up one second to one second based, like, the timer of the video was one real life second and seeing it go off every five seconds. And I was just like, no, <laughs> Fire <laughs> like, no wonder Fire Mall was as easy as it was, um, that we could just ignore that entire mechanic because we killed it fast enough before it mattered. Right. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. I, I, I was going to say, I know that this is a really, really hard question, but to what extent do you think raiding with 1.12 talents trivializes early content in Molten Core and Ixia Blackwing Layer? Uh, I think it matters a lot. Um, especially because the early content uh, is so well known. Every You know every mechanic when it's supposed to happen. Um, they're all pretty melee friendly and at 1.12 talents it pretty heavily favored fury warriors and rogues and especially fury warriors did not really exist until like maybe towards the tail end of bwl but really aq40 when aq40 came out and they had the warrior talent revamp which i think was 1.9 mm -hmm. um uh, 1.6 yeah 1.6 so yeah mm -hmm. bwl um so once that happens, then you start opening the door. Now, Rogues, I believe, was like 1.10 or 1.11, mm -hmm. where they finally had their revamp, and that made them much stronger and more cohesive as a DPS class. Now, you transport them back into Molten Core with the content being pretty melee friendly. Um, it's no wonder that the melee charts for Molten Core and BWL, uh, when you look at the like raid logs, or I the top 10 is like all yellow and brown um, and maybe you have a good <laughs> seems okay to me to honest <laughs> oh, geez. and so maybe maybe on a couple fights you have that are caster friendly you have more casters or maybe like um you know some good casters will show up in the top 10 but it's pretty melee friendly and when those melee talents finally get applied for rogues that they can dominate the early content so i think it matters a lot um so I don't know how you deal with it though. Uh, do you do you backport talents to as they were, which Blizzard should have the ability to do? You could do that. Uh, it would be fun to do that. Um, I played a Warlock, and will continue to play a Warlock, and it'd be interesting to play a Warlock without an OP Death Coil. Um, <laughs> or, but in some degree, like the talent revamps existed because the class, the classes as as has they played, sucked. Like hunters, like, are not all that good in 1.12, but pre-talent revamp where your best abilities are hidden behind 31 point talents, or priests where your best abilities are hidden behind 31 point talents, uh, that doesn't feel good. Like, mm -hmm. how would how would uh, druids like to have to get 31 points just so they can get yeah. Yeah. Um before the talent revamps? So those existed for a reason, and do we just you know? reverse that reasoning so we can experience badness i don't know 
Um, so I don't have a great answer how you fix the difficulty level of Molten Core uh, with 1.12 talents outside of doing significant changes to health and damage values. Yeah. So, Would you like to see that, changes to health and damage values? I don't I don't really want to see that. Um it might be it might be necessary for molten core specifically. Mm -hmm. For BWL and beyond, I don't want to see it absolutely. I think that the content of AQ40 and Nax is hard enough. It, even for like in view of how private servers have done it, it's hard enough that people will have difficulty clearing it. Like a lot of guilds in my view, uh, the wild guilds uh, AQ40, they just died because they couldn't get past a certain few bosses. Um, so that means that the difficulty exists there. Now, the top end guilds are always going to clear the content quick, and that's true in BFA today. Like, obviously, Mythic and Cahoon was difficult, and they it took them like a week to clear it, but they still cleared it in a week, and they're the like the best guild methods that best guild in the, in the mm -hmm. world so the best vanilla guilds in the world are going to clear the content really quickly maybe day one but that's probably okay because the the skill gap between the top end guilds yeah. and your average guild are great enough that the average guilds can still find difficulty through the content mm -hmm. do you think that classic wow rating encounters are going to be much harder than private server encounters with correct armor values and resistance values and whatever else like fl the flame buffet thing you mentioned Yes, um, armor values and resistance values are the great unknowns when it comes to um, raid content. So with that, because it's impossible for us to know it, uh, it's impossible for us to, to reproduce it correctly. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, yeah, Tip, Tips has to leave. He had a he has a family thing he's got to do. Uh, so so Tips is gonna bow out real quick. Uh, before Tips goes, guys, uh, I just want to go ahead and mention we are doing another giveaway. We we did have our winners for the three BlizzCon virtual tickets. Uh, it was originally one, and then we we changed it to three. But uh, we will be doing another giveaway, and I'm gonna go ahead and post that link in the chat, guys. Uh, so if you guys haven't followed us, uh, sub to our YouTube, follow us on on Twitter. Uh, Follow us on Twitch as well. Uh, go ahead and click that link in the chat. Uh, that that don't do the number one. Do the second one that I that I posted right there. This one that I'm posting in the chat right now. Uh, so I will be emailing the winners again. Uh, the winners from last week are uh, and I announced it at the beginning, but Ethugged, Misty Cal, Seven Eleven, and uh, Mr. Ghost Lore were the winners. So, uh, so yeah, go ahead and check out that link. Uh, if you guys already follow us, if you guys already sub to us, then all you have to do is just fill in the fields and then, and then click everything so that it verifies it. Uh, for those of you guys watching on YouTube, this will be pinned to the top of the comments. It'll be in the description. Uh, I'll be posting that link for you guys uh, whenever the time comes, whenever you guys are watching this. So, yeah, good luck to you guys for that. And uh, Tips, Tips is going to bow out for now, and uh, we'll, we'll keep going. Thank you so much, Nano, for joining us tonight. Uh, yeah. Always a pleasure, anytime. And uh, as fans, stay safe. Uh, take care, boys. And to the chat, congratulations on who won. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, for right? sure. So, take care, brother. Take care. All right. See you guys later. I'll leave you with uh, this nice uh, straw summer hat. I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. Um, <laughs> but, all right, we'll hardly care. notice the difference. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Good night. See you, dude. Um, so yeah, you know now that uh, I kind of want to look ahead a little bit and and put on put on the tinfoil hat a little bit. You you were talking to Tips before, and you had told him that you hadn't heard from uh, that you hadn't heard from Damon or Viper in quite some time. Is yep. that right? So yep. you you hadn't heard from them for a while, and there are recently some alleged leaks that. I, I've been saying this. You can't really put any any stock into it. You can't really. You got to take it all with a grain of salt. I think more than anything, it's um, it, it's really well thought out and kind of gives the uh, gives people like the feeling of like they want to believe it because of confirmation bias. That's basically what it is. And I'm gonna I'm totally gonna play into it right now because it's fun to talk about. But you haven't heard Your from them in a while. In <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. You haven't heard from them in a while. And no. these, these leaks say that there's potentially two people from the NOS team 
uh, that are working, you know, in, in some fashion. We think more than anything it would be uh, kind of like in a, in a consultant type of deal, like consulting, I guess, you know, talking about maybe player data, player behavior, stuff like that. How likely or unlikely would you say it is that Damon or Viper could be working with them? Um, so I don't want to put like a percentage on it, but it's completely reasonable that they would be working at Blizzard, um, mostly because of how deep of fans they are of Blizzard and how capable they are as developers and, and just people themselves. Um, so the one thing in that the English version of the leak was like, the NOS people are there for ensured authenticity yeah, or whatever yeah. the phrase right, was. Authenticity, yeah. 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 We are not the arbiters of <laughs> authenticity. Uh, we don't decide what's classic and what's not. Uh, we're, we're not that important. Um, but one thing that I know Damon and Viper uh, care about is that the game is is authentic and that it plays like classic so one thing that they were adamant about for nos for instance is never implementing any sort of shop because that did not exist in vanilla and it would it would cause ideas of right. impropriety on our on our side um so those kind of things that they're they are advocates for um i have said one thing i will say is like i think Va diamond uh, damon and viper are great I think they're incredibly smart, talented, capable people, and I hope that they're working on the classic team because that would be great, um, not just for them, but also for us as players and the community because then I would know that at least two of the people that are working on the team were super passionate about what was what the team was doing, providing the right content for people. Uh, so yeah. I, d I don't know if they are or not. I haven't spoken to them and continue to not. I, don't, I haven't heard from them. They've they've disengaged uh, completely i hope that they are and it would be great if they did well for me like i i can't imagine other people than them having spent more time sifting through old web archive links and old un old uncovered long forgotten videos like if anyone knows about this maybe forgotten stuff it's probably them right uh that them and me yeah um... <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly, exactly okay yeah um <laughs> I, I probably spent more time digging through 240p videos than, than they ended up doing because they would give me stuff to, to research and then I would go go research it. Um, but but yeah, they they are very experienced with the content of, of classic and um, would be would be at least serve as, as some role if they were in an, an advisory role would serve as some sort of useful consulting people for sure especially when it comes in terms of like itemization because they understood oh, yeah. the, the, the importance of that and ha what the big impact that it would make oh yeah and I, I have no i have no problem imagining that some of this like week to week or month to month itemization changes have been lost that they weren't recorded and right. there's only way, the only way to know that is is old web archive links and stuff like that. Yeah, I have no problem imagining that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so guys, pretty soon we uh, we do want to go to Q and A here. Uh, pretty soon. So if you guys want to uh, go ahead and tweet questions at us, uh, I'll be searching hashtag Classicast. Uh, my Twitter is sfantv. Stay safe, Warlock. Uh, tips out, baby. Uh, tips if you want to answer some questions for us <laughs> at Straw Hat. <laughs> But yeah, no. If, if you guys want to uh, ask us any questions, we'll we'll go into Q and A. We'll start with Twitter, and then we'll we'll also go into taking questions from the chat as well. <clears throat> so uh, actually, this is a question that is it comes up all the time, and I real I really want to know what you think about it, Nano. What do you think about post next Ramus content or bonus content for Classic WoW? What do you think about that? So I really like um, the mechanics systems and content of vanilla um so far i've only been hoping that it would exist at all so i haven't got and now that it will i haven't gotten to the point where i'm hoping for more than what already exists within the scope of vanilla um i think the natural progression after vanilla is to release uh, burning crusade option 
if they were to go that direction. Um, it seems like most of the work that they've had to do so far, at least how, how they've presented it, is more of the technical side of making vanilla work. Um, and if they were able to overcome that and then use that for TBC, then I think that makes a lot of sense for them. Now, how does vanilla work? Well, how does an MMO work when there is a time limit attached to it? Is a question that may not have ever has ever been explored. So we know that vanilla ends at Nax, and so when Nax is released, then what? Do right. you do you play it like a Diablo season and like port everybody to like the non ladder version of Classic WoW, where you can everything is released at this point, and you can just join and keep on playing your characters and then you know refresh and have you know fresh for all the <laughs> new people out there um but you can you know restart uh, vanilla allow again um, i'm not sure how they'll do all that stuff in terms of 1.13 i think it would be interesting if they were to release post next content for vanilla um now I have questions about how it would work from an itemization standpoint and power level, like the the power gap between mm -hmm. Nax gear, which is already incredibly strong even compared to BWL AQ40 gear. Now, in order for the new content to matter, you'd probably have to step up the power even more. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's concerns about that and and balance when it comes to level 60. Um, but it would be interesting uh, to have a different raid. It would be interesting how they would envision a new raid with new raid mechanics in the vanilla world, might be. Uh, there's probably opportunities for them to do that. Um, so if they if they did it, I would probably play it and probably enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they're going to spend the development effort and resources to do that, but it would be really interesting. Um, if they if they did that, the way that they release content with patches is they always release like a raid, maybe a couple dungeons, and maybe like a new PvP battleground, something like that. That's, that's how how I would envision patch 1.13 looking like. Um, I've you know brainstormed in my crazy days of like maybe I want to create like custom content uh, back in back in the day. Like how how would you do that? So thinking about like. Maybe there should be a, a Timber Mall Holds dungeon because Timber mm -hmm. Mall Hold is, is a place that exists that we never get to see. And the Timber Mall has enough, it has its own reputation already. Um, and there's an area that it could easily exist uh, that would be interesting. And plus, there's no dungeon in that area of the map at all in the northeast portion of Kalimdor. So if you were to release a new dungeon, maybe you do something with Timber Mall Hold. That might be cool. Mm -hmm. um, my, my biggest concern, like you mentioned, is power creep. And I think if you just avoid power creep by offering a, a, a more dungeons or raids that doesn't have an increase in, 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 in item power, you that is, that is lateral content. I think that lateral content, I mean, players engage in content for a reward. Otherwise, you know, players respond to incentives. If they're not incentivized to do, to do the content, I think they might do it once or twice and then not continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And so right. I think um, it wouldn't have much replayability, maybe if it's if it's lateral content. Right. Well. Yeah. Uh, I think to that point, and it, my personal opinion, uh, I really do want to see Burning Crusade. Uh, I think that Burning Crusade could potentially be even like if if Classic is successful. I think Burning Crusade could potentially be even more successful. Um, but I think that after a full cycle, the consideration of doing like post nax content and doing like 1.13. Uh, with kind of a more horizontal progression and uh, let's say they, they went to Grim Batol or you know you do Oldham, Caverns of Time, Karazhan. There, there's so much stuff in the game on the map. Timberman Hold, like you said. I think you could do... It, it wouldn't... It, you couldn't have it be like a flat horizontal progression but kind of more at a, a, a very low angle and right. maybe even changing up the... Because how the tier sets work, especially in Nax the Nax tier sets are all designed for like what's considered the most optimal optimal spec for every class you know for the hybrids for example like paladins are holy uh the druids are healer. it's yeah. that's just how it works because it's the hardest content but if they were to kind of change it a little bit and now you had like offset plate healing gear or 
you you took what would normally be like a main set tier and like the what would be tier four uh like you took that and you made that more for healing like the offset pieces and then you made like a prop paladin tanking set and you made those set bonuses kind of make up for some of the um uh, some of the shortcomings maybe like for like example a set bonus that gives paladins taunt or something like yeah that. like you make judgment work as a taunt basically like okay. something like that so you wouldn't actually have to change the talents or anything like that like or, or add skills but basically you give them the set bonus to now if you judge then it also works as a taunt um and then maybe like the set gives like block value and stuff like that uh, i think yeah. it would not only be like a a a smaller like a like a just minor minor power creep to the other raids but it really changes how the gear works uh as opposed to just like the same type of gear but better i think would be kind of yeah. interesting but again I, I don't think they should do that until like a full cycle uh, of classic yeah it like 1.13 is kind of fun to think about and talk about and imagine i think the what i would prefer in my ideal is that you run through the content i don't know how long it takes i i'm in favor of a faster progression cycle because the being able to farm gear in the old raids allows you to power up to the point where the newer I content agree is, i really is, agree with that is powered down but so let's say that, like there's a year between launch and finish quote unquote um, and then transfer everybody over to the non-ladder version, release TBC, give people the option to copy their characters to TBC and start at level 60, or mm -hmm. you can re-level your new Drain Eyes and Blood Elves from level 1, um, and then refresh uh, Vanilla again. That would be my, my preference, mm -hmm. where now, now you have TBC as an option, and it creates a natural progression but you still can do classic if you want if you want to finish farming your tier three that exists for you if you want to start fresh that exists for you um so that that would be my preference where tbc is released the non-ladder version of classic exists and a fresh version of classic exists that would be like my next progression through this yeah so to go in more on what you were saying going into classic round this happens on private servers people have two or three or four times more Blackwing layer lockout full clears worth of loot than people right. had actually in Vanilla WoW. Back then, people had to learn the encounters, and it was just harder and stuff. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that with Classic, are we speed up the release timeline to make AQ harder because of less time to farm Blackwing layer gear? I actually, I, I actually kind of like that idea. It would make everything a little bit harder. Yeah. It's something to consider, too. Like, And um, Nefarian was not killed in the original version of the game until Zolgareb was released. And that was a year, that was a month later. So, hmm. considering how long it took them to kill the final boss of that dungeon, and then they actually got Zolgareb gear. Now, the best skills were clearing it with, before they really had a big difference in Zolgareb gear. But Zolgareb released, like, huge changes to, like, caster itemization, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like, now all of a sudden you had this brand new set that was better than anything that you could get in BWL as from a pure DPS standpoint, uh, and now that exists for you. So those kind of things don't exist in the private server world because Nefarian does not last long enough for a private server to develop and really soldier up. Um, so it's those kind of things where you have to figure out how, how it's going to work. Uh, but you're right, like being able to farm more Nefarian's tiers and being able to farm more Wrath sets before you have to enter AQ40 makes AQ40 less hard. Mm -hmm. um, now you have to balance that between the top end guilds and the average guilds because the average guilds probably not going to clear to BWL in the first week. Uh, they typically didn't, I should say, um, at yeah. least on the stars. Most guilds did not clear the content in the first week. Um, so you have to balance around those and, and how that works. So. Mm -hmm. It's real interesting how, how ZG works. ZG and AQ22 kind of as, as more content being put in kind of as, as a catch-up mechanic for a lot of people. And especially looking back on, you know, actual Vanilla WoW uh, mm -hmm. with BWL not being completed until after ZG was out. ZG had a, you know, it had drops in there to kind of help people out who hadn't gotten a bunch of gear from MC or whatever, people who are new to the game. Uh, like there's even a two-handed axe that increases attack power to, to Dragonkin, I think. I mean, there's one thing that's good for, you know, <laughs> and, you know, there's not a lot of people using two handed, but um, 
but still like it, it's it's just interesting like how it all works and what they added into the game for um to to be able to complete the content that they had released prior yeah um so i i saw um somebody asked me if i was under alliance and classic and i'm alliance there so you go so you're an alliance with the warlock what race do you play <laughs> uh no what gender do you play male <laughs> Okay, okay, close <laughs> enough. All right, that's fine. That's fine. I'll meet you halfway. No, the reason is is that if you, well, one, gnome is better than human because the only good thing about being a human is sword skill and reputation decreases, and you know you can just right. play ten percent more and get the same amount of reputation. You are uh, so smart, by the way. You're so smart. Okay, anyway, go on. <laughs> uh, but but you have if you're going to be alliance and you're going to be a warlock, you should be a gnome. One, you get more int, so you can increase your crit slightly and maybe get one more shadow bullet off before you have to life tap and second escape artist is crucial like the only thing that really kills you is melee and if you can escape artist away from rogues and warriors then you're gonna get a chance to actually kill them um i forgot how i get got on this uh oh alliance or <laughs> yeah alliance or, or horde. horde yeah um yeah. oh the reason the reason why no male specifically is that if you wear the big green beard and specific kind of hair, it looks perfect with Nemesis. There you go. Uh, okay. Okay. That's planning. That's planning ahead. Yeah. It's real transmog good. before transmog. <laughs> yeah. You have to, yeah, you have to create films. your character <laughs> intentionally to look good with an intentional item set. True. Yeah. Very true. Uh, yeah. This is a really right. good question that I, I, I just want to bring up right now. Uh, I really like this from Zethra. Uh, and this is very nitty gritty. So. What do you think about the changing of Lotus from, like, you know, for, for BOP versus BOE, uh, the number of spawns, Blizzlike versus Nas spawns, Timer of Rare spawns, Lupos, Tidal Charm, uh, thoughts on the uniqueness of pets, Shadow Damage on Lupos, Chase Speed of pets, and stuff like that. Basically, uh, just kind of the scope of that. Yeah. Um, so this goes, the, the Lotus is, is interesting because Nas did not change the Lotus from being BOP to BOE. So we had BOE Lotus from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's because we didn't know that it was BOP until 1.7, until we started figuring it out. Um, I'm kind of in favor of that idea. Um, mostly if you do progressive itemization, all of your casters are basically going to suck for a while. And a flask of supreme power is going to be more spell power than all of your gear put together. Just <laughs> one consumable is better than all of the rest of your gear which is kind of crazy to think about mm -hmm. and when you start stacking up all those consumables together then that's the most important thing to the game not the gear that you're carrying mm -hmm. and that that's something that did not exist in the original game mostly i think because of lack of information or lack of ability to farm will to farm um but it's something to consider now because the current meta, so to speak, for raiding guilds is that every caster, at least for the top end raiding guilds, is that every caster is supposed to have full consumables. And you know, every melee is supposed to have full consumables before they go in. And the reason is, is that those consumables are really freaking good. Yeah. Um, and so be, having Lotus be BLP doesn't change the fact that people can have Lotus, but it significantly decreases the ability of people to purchase flasks the the increase the bar it, has been yeah. the bar has been raised in a significant portion because somebody both has to have herbalism at 300 and farm black lotus and the recipe to make the flasks before they can sell those flasks and most likely the supply of those is going to go down and then forces people to not use those which is probably better so that's something something to consider um i, I think i'm in favor of having bop um below this for a while just because mm -hmm. it'll decrease the power level of the average player huh. yeah i'm a big fan and it, it having it that way rewards people that can play 20 hours a day and farm gold and then farm their like i i really like that about vanilla wow if you're a complete no life you can you can excel <laughs> yeah that's yeah that's true um the, the number of spawns, Blizzlike versus Nos spawns. Nos spawns, there's like a few versions of them. Um, 
just to give a little background, especially for Black Lotus, we completely changed the system in which it spawns. Now, I don't think how it spawned originally was a Blizz-like version anyway, where there was like a set four spawns and you could predict, you know, where they were. And if you had a, a guild of people who were incentivized to farm as many Lotus as possible, uh, which may have been the case, you could sit on every spawn and have the exact timer and nobody would ever see a Black Lotus other than your group of people. I think that's bad, and I don't think that's something that Blizzard's going to do. So what we did is we, instead of having four to eight spawns um, for Black Lotus, we changed it to at least 50 in every zone that it was at, and then varied the timer with some wiggle room, like plus or minus a certain amount of minutes. I think it's the system that still exists today for whoever's using the NOS core. Um, so and I think that's better because you could random yourself into a Black Lotus spawn. You can't, you can't camp 50 different spots, even if you knew where all of them. It's just impossible for you to do right. that. Um, so I think I think that's better. Um, the uniqueness of pets is an interesting thing, um, especially Lupos creates a big change for the ability for hunters and it makes the biggest difference in pvp with lupos being able to ignore armor and with beast mastery hunters just like you can click a couple buttons and basically beat every caster um and i i don't know what to do about that because it is was like to have them be pre 1.9 but the system as exists in 1.12 does not have lupos being op and normalized speeds and all that kind of stuff so mm -hmm. I think I'm in favor of the the final 1.12 system for pets just because it creates balance and it doesn't create this barrier where like hunters are useless unless they uh, spend their life farming for lupos. Um, I don't think that's a healthy system and you should be able to play a hunter without having to invest your life into lupos to be relevant. Um, yeah. Definitely having conversations and, and thinking about questions like this highlights how simple it is to just say no changes. There's so much more thought that has to go into it. I, mm -hmm. I do not envy, I do not envy Blizzard's position right now. They're after, they're <laughs> actually having to think through all of this. It's a lot of work they're having to do. Yeah, the the no changes. You have a question there though. It's like, is it no changes, patch for patch, no changes, or is it 1.12 no changes, and then dealing with you know, progressive itemization for, uh, is like, well, you kind of have to do patch for patch progression if you're going to try to do that, but then not for spells and talents and abilities. And so that there's um, there's a question mark there. that There's a lot of question marks there that had to be solved. That's the thing I'm most looking forward to for this BlizzCon is that um, Ian in the little five-minute teaser video talked that they were going to get into their philosophy on how they're, they're rebuilding Vanilla, and I'm going to... Uh, I, sp I spent $50 for well, 50 battle net dollars, wow gold essentially for, <laughs> uh, uh, for, for the virtual ticket. And I did that mainly for the demo, but the, another, the other thing that I'm going to be watching intently is that philosophy, di them digging into how they were doing the, how are they rebuilding the Wow. I want to, I want to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So kind of in that yeah. same, uh, I was just going to add, cause it's, it's kind of on the same track. With, uh, with everything else, Alliance not having Jujus in the original game until I believe it was 1.10 or 1.11. I think, I think it's 1.9. 1. 1. 1. 1. Oh, 1.9? Yeah. Okay, 1. yeah. 1.10, yeah. Like Something that. like that. Um, s stuff like that, I, and I believe on from from what I know, on NOS, it, it, Alliance had it from the beginning? Correct. Yeah, so uh, I think stuff like that is going to be really interesting to see how they approach it. Like, that's something that they'll likely... Uh, I could see them likely just, like, leaving... Uh, leaving in for the alliance as well. H how do you feel about that? Like, what was your guys' uh, decision behind that? Um, the reason why it was available for the alliance is we were unaware that it wasn't available for the alliance <laughs> okay. at, at the time. So, like I said, like we weren't perfect. We did our mm -hmm. best, but there is just so many things that changed along the the way, and the game is just so big that we just didn't have the manpower to figure out all this stuff before it was already an issue so like let's just say we did figure it out by the time the bwl was released do we then after the fact make the change 
um, and upset half the player base because they no longer can farm juju power and then there's cries of unfairness for factions and whatever it is but I, we never got to that point but that would be a question for a server to make that um and plus the the buffs especially for melee are really strong mm -hmm. um and even the resistances can be really good if you are struggling to to beat a boss where you need the resistances so i mean ha, ha, there was no way for us to be perfect we were never going to be perfect so a lot of, a lot of times when we didn't do something so another big example the biggest i think the biggest mistake that we ever made from an itemization perspective on nost was releasing the updated blue pvp gear at the time of zilgar up uh rather than waiting longer for it and the reasoning was because we put our trust in one of the other qa people who was incorrect in telling us that it was supposed to be released during zilgar up and we didn't mm -hmm. do enough have enough time to do the background check on it essentially and to, to verify it and so we released it and then once it was released and we realized our error it was almost too late at that point to roll it back because uh, then we were t people had vendored their gear to because they had you know right gear that was better than what they needed so they just got rid of it and then it just would have been and we weren't going to do a big rollback because uh, that's just not going to happen so at that point it just became too late um, and so part of that was just like we're not being paid to do this and we have limited time and you know we just couldn't get everything right um, but that was my biggest regret probably because it significantly changed people's item itemization in BWL specifically like it completely especially for casters it like basically invalidated the Black Wing Cabal that you got off of Razor Core and basically invalidated Mission Dares if you were ranked 10. And those are two items that back in the day were sought after because they were so good. Mm -hmm. And we invalidated them by a, by a wrong decision that we made. I'm so curious to see how correct Blizzard launches Classic WoW or if they'll if they'll realize something is wrong and maybe a player will send in a video, hey, Blizzard, this is actually how it was in Vanilla WoW. And if Blizzard will then tweak Classic WoW to be in line with how it was back in the day, I wonder how correct they'll be or if they'll be making changes week to week based on player feedback. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we do, do know about Blizzard is that they try to put as much polish on the game as possible. And you would hope that they have enough people to go through these things um, because it is their job and they can invest all the time. Um, now, will they? Do they have enough people on their team to you know, successfully go through all these different points and get them correct the first time around, hopefully? Um, some of it might just be philosophy changes that we might disagree with um, from time to time that we'll have to just kind of suck it up and deal with, I think. But but, but we'll see. I, I'm optimistic that Blizzard's going to deliver uh, an excellent version of Classic well. I think so. I have to say, everything we have, of, of course, there's still questions about how, how Classic WoW will play out, but everything we have heard, I think, has been very good so far. Do you agree with that? Uh, I, I think so. Uh, we haven't heard a ton, um, but I think that there's, before they set out to do this, I believe that they wanted to do it right. And doing it right means to make it vanilla WoW as it was, mm -hmm. as best as they could. And what that means for people who are as experienced and deep in the game as some of us and your viewers, who knows? But for the average player, they're going to be like, well, this is classic WoW. This is WoW as it was. And I want them to be able to experience that. Mm -hmm. What I think is going to be funny whenever... I, I think it's going to be funny whenever there's people trying to tell Blizzard, wait, no, that's not how that's not how it was on NOS. That's not how it was here or there. And it's like, well, yeah, that's because they've made that custom change, you know? I think that'll, I think that'll be funny to see. Right. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be like, wait, I didn't realize this was supposed to do that. Um, especially like class stuff, because um, one of the other, the one of the parts of our, the presentation we did at Blizzard, that I did at Blizzard, was talking about the different classes and the and the, the place that they were when we closed down the server, whether they were in a good place or a bad place. And one class I talked about was, and this is relevant for you, Esfen, is, uh, is Paladins, mm -hmm. because they changed a lot in their mechanics throughout the course of the game where if you're trying to prove that this ability should do this or should be modified and multiplied by this there's just a lot of misinformation mm -hmm. out there with it that you can then you know 
say it's supposed to look like the 1.6 version in 1.12 and it's almost impossible for us for you to fight every single argument the negative of every single argument it's like no it shouldn't exist like that um so once we get to the point where wizard releases it then we can at least hopefully put those arguments to rest because mm -hmm. they are the definitive answer on like well no consecration is not supposed to scale with ap i'm sorry right yeah, and there's, there's a lot of stuff, like, kind of under the hood as well. Like, with Hammer of Wrath resetting your swing timer because it's a spell, but it effectively makes it, like, useless as part of a PvE DPS rotation or Repentance resetting right. your swing timer. But if you Repentance during Bubble, then all of a sudden you're not swinging for, like, 14 seconds. Like, yeah, there's, there's all kinds <laughs> of, like, little stuff like that that it's like, wait, was it like this or was it not like this? Like, Repentance is an instant spell. Why is it resetting swing timer? So, yeah, it's, it's all kinds of stuff like that that it'll be, uh, it'll be exciting to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one person asked a question about um, adding timers like the one hour veil lockout. Um, I think those are positive things. Um, now, it might really suck for the guild that wipes the veil for an hour and then cannot attempt them at all for the rest of that week. But that's how it was in vanilla. Mm -hmm. And. If you couldn't kill them within an hour, then your progression for that week is halted. And I think that's okay. So yeah. it was the same way for for your, um, Ragnaros as well. You had one hour per week, right? And then they buffed it to two hours. So I, I think those are positive things. Um, you know, that's part of the game. Mm -hmm. If you can't kill it within an hour, then try again next week. Well, I, I think it kind of adds to the um, to to the whole, I guess, sport of rating, right? Whenever you have that extra the extra thing factored in right. right so it's like okay well we we not only did we not kill the boss but we got to recover faster get buffs out get reses out everybody run back pop your consumes right. get ready find out what happened and then do it fast enough in order to get the most attempts in in that amount of time uh, i think that's really important yeah mm -hmm. there's a reason the reason why veil vale destroyed a lot of guilds in vanilla is because he wiped them for weeks on end in an hour and and they gave up. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a good question. This is from uh, Runkle BC on Twitter. Uh, thoughts on server population. What is the sweet spot of two and a half to twelve k when servers will be localized and not have infinite players around the clock? So, uh, and I kind of want to add to this is like where like how did you guys make your decision of the cap to have on the server? So, at least in terms of our decision to have caps on server limited by more things than blizzard would be limited by which is um finances um mm -hmm. namely like it's expensive to run those servers and we were relying solely on donations and sometimes out of our own pocket to make the servers continue to run and so um part of the the you know the economics of it for us was we can't have two different pvp servers and then localize one of them and then let another one run because we just don't have the resources to do that. Um, I don't think that 12,000 players online concurrently is a healthy place for servers to be, uh, especially when, in terms of the leveling progression where you're, there's like lines of an hour to kill the one quest mob with a respawn timer of 30 minutes. Um, that I don't think that's a healthy thing necessarily. Now, I don't think that they should necessarily reduce that time to be a minute so everyone can do it whenever they want. Um, I think waiting is appropriate for vanilla. But 12K is a little little heavy. Uh, 2.5, on the other hand, I think that they were probably limited by economics. Maybe not economics, but just technical limitations at that time. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a, num a sweet spot number that we can pinpoint and say this is the best number for it to be at. But it should feel differently than the way that people do on private servers, where every single moment that you walk on, there could be 10,000 people. Like, there probably should be times where there's a lower population, and you can go out and get more farming done um, without competition from the next uh, region's prime time. I think that's normal and appropriate. So we'll, we'll see. I don't think there's a sweet spot number that we can guess at and be right. OK. Yeah, one big thing I remember about Vanilla WoW and TBC um, as well was, you know, if I knew I needed to farm a bunch of primal lives in TBC or whatever it was, Dreamfoil, I would um, 
I'd wait till nighttime because people would be asleep. And that, you know, it felt like nighttime because there weren't many people out. The, obviously, the skybox is dark. It was cool. It, 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 it did add to the immersion a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's appropriate. Uh, and pretty soon, guys, we'll, uh, I'll, I want to take some questions from the chat as well. So if you guys don't have Twitter, uh, we do, uh, do want to take some questions from the chat as well. I think this is a good question from uh, Glaston. He says, uh, do you think Blizzard will enforce some of the rules that a lot of servers enforce, such as safe spotting and fixing things such as DM solo farming on, uh, on, on the official classic servers? Uh, I, I want to go ahead and say something. I, I do remember that people would get in trouble for safe spotting in retail vanilla. I remember people getting in trouble for safe spotting. I remember people getting in trouble for doing the, uh, doing the wall jumps in Warsong. Like, you can jump up to the graveyard with, like, if you, if you hit it right. Because that, that stuff was considered exploits. And I remember people getting reported for that and getting in trouble. Yeah. Um, I, th I think Blizzard's philosophy, typically, is they want to avoid having their GMs deal with day-to-day uh, -day player interactions as much as possible. So my thinking is that they're going to do their best to make safe spotting almost impossible through whatever means that means, whether it's placing extra guards or even sometimes putting, you know, the dreaded invisible boxes in places where people can't reach. They're going to try to keep safe spotting from ever happening more so than banning people for safe spotting because it's going to require a lot of GM work. Um, yeah, that, yeah. That would be my guess. I know this, this ties into wall jumping as well. I, I remember with Pre-4.0 pre when Kata came out, you could wall jump. I remember doing it in Goldshire and all over the place, right? Getting on top of the inn in some battlegrounds. And then post-Cataclysm, they removed it. And so if they're, I, I guess I don't really know what I'm talking about, but maybe if they're running Classic WoW off of the modern client and retrofitting it, um, maybe that maybe that problem won't be there anyway. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, there are places in Worse on Gulch where you can get, like, the smart people who realize how to do it, like... There's a place where you can get up in the, the horde section and then get behind all the architecture, cast slow fall on yourself, and get to an unreachable place where literally nobody can get to you. Um, and you can sit there with the flag and stall out the entire game forever if you really wanted to. Um, those kind of things I'm certain that Blizzard's going to gonna deal with. Um, the, the second part of that question is like fixing things such as Dire Mall solo farming. That's a pretty big question because that would fall under the category of changes, uh, whether it's drop rates or pathing. Actually, pathing may not be something that I would consider changes necessarily, because I don't believe that the pathing for the dogs is currently exists in Diamond. All those people who are playing, I don't think that that's proper. I think they should be able to just go ahead and get you when you're on that little ledge. Um, but as far as like drop rates are concerned. Um, uh, that's a big question because it's no question that the uh, mage farming in Dire Mall East is easily the most um, lucrative farm gold farm spot in the game, especially because you can do it solo without competition or without worry. So, to the point where people are leveling multiple mages just to farm gold, and uh, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> right. I don't I don't know what they're gonna do about that. Yeah, that'll be. I, I think that'll be something that's very interesting to see. Um, well, this is a question from Kazi, and and we've talked about this before uh, about the Talisman of Binding Shard. How do you guys feel about Talisman of the Binding Shard dropping in Classic? Like, if just one were to drop per server, or one period, or if it shouldn't drop at all? I'll let you take it, Nano. I think it's kind of a cool item, and it doesn't matter at all. Um don't think that it was ever intended to drop though right. um so i'll be okay if one per server and one person gets it it really doesn't make any difference at all so like it's not a powerful item that's going to really change the way that that player that guild um does so i'm okay with it existing and dropping but i doubt that it actually does because it was never intended to drop mm-hmm yeah, I, I guess I don't feel super strongly either way, but I, I guess part of me thinks those should be special memes of the past and not recreated. The same thing for the Zolgrub plague that happened. I right. see people suggesting they recreate that intentionally. I think they should just let that be in the past as kind of a cool thing that happened. 
Fun funny story, we tried to uh, reproduce the Zulgur bug event on uh, Nostalrius <laughs> by implementing the old... Uh, so, like, in the server code, there's spells that are represented with old underscore and then spell effects, whatever. So we tried to make that work on Hakar to be able to allow players the chance to experience the old ZG plague event. Um, the problem is, at least on our, the spell just didn't work. It didn't didn't do anything. It was dead. So we, we couldn't, unfortunately, do that. But we were going to do it for, like, the first, like, four hours, I think, that the that ZG was out and then didn't revert it. Um, but I, I, in general, agree. Um, and this extends some more things to, and I don't want to sound like I'm going crazy here, but um, from my experience on in, in observing the way that the war effort has rolled out, um, it's clear that players don't care about the war effort the way that they used to, or the way that it's being revered. Uh, now, it might be different if there's like eight servers and the war effort is released on all of those servers at the same time, and then there is legitimate, like, race to see who can clear the war effort first in order so they can get in and kill Cthune, then people might care about it. Um, but I have concerns that it's not going to be cool uh, on Classic WoW because people are just like, what? why would I turn in my why would I go farm Purple Lotus so I can turn it into this vendor? Or on the flip side it becomes invalidated because people know exactly what the war effort requires and then save all those items and then do they have to adjust the numbers or do they just let it be right um, i've always been in favor of changing the required items for the war effort oh they throw people similar. off basically yeah so to something similar now i'm not saying like you have to turn in you know mountain silver sage now uh, but you know changing it from or just to like golden sand sim or something like that another herb that doesn't really have that much of an impact that there's like an abundance of uh on the server uh that still requires you to go out and farm but people can't anticipate exactly what those items are for the war effort and then invalidate the whole thing by you know saving up ahead of time right that's interesting it's really interesting i think a big thing going uh going into classic I think you're absolutely right. Like, if there's only one server, if there's only one classic server, what could happen is you basically have the big guilds come together and they say, hey, look, we're we're going to do it this way and we're going to stall the release because we want to have as many people as possible get um, get the head of the Broodlord, right? So we can have as many black uh, black battle chargers scare as possible. Boards, like, yeah, yeah scare boards, basically. Uh, battle tanks, I mean. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think that'll be really interesting because I think it could end up being kind of like a clout thing like oh our server got it first and someone in our guild cleared before anybody else i, I don't know right. i think i think stuff like that'll be really interesting to see how it pans out yeah yeah i mean what's what's going to be more prestigious having 10 scareboard mounts in your guild or having you know world first a aq clear right right yeah uh, th that is something that will change because there will presumably be multiple servers available um with different guilds competing on those servers for firsts um, that's going to create a level of excitement and anticipation with the first wrists that didn't exist on the stall race mm -hmm. yeah guys we'll uh we'll take a few more questions here we'll take a few more questions here and uh before we, before we wrap it up so uh, i do want to take questions from the chat as well um Let's do, let's do one more question from KJ Freshly on Twitter. Uh, does Nano think that there is enough vanilla content to sustain several years with no expansions and horizontal progression? With no expansions or horizontal progression? If Classic served as a sort of portrait that would hang in a Blizzard museum, how long can a snapshot of history sustain players? I like this question. Yeah. Um, so I think the, que the answer to the question that I have is both yes and no, which is... Uh, I don't think that there's enough vanilla content to keep the same player engaged on the same without release, like doing a new version of vanilla for years. Uh, I think if you ended vanilla at max, that there's not enough content for people to play that for three years. 
But if you were to re-release the game every year, I think that there's enough content for and enough replayability that people could do that every year and and play that for three years. If that makes sense. So, and and we have we have examples of that, right? How many people uh, have played on the Stalrius and then happens to maybe play on a different server uh, mm-hmm. after that, um, which you shouldn't anymore, by the way, where classic is coming soon. And let's focus on classic and making classic great and uh, leave the private server world to the private server. Um, but I think that there's enough vanilla content that people will play it and play it again and play it again and play it again. Um, but not enough that it would last one player three years on the same content. I agree, and I—I mm-hmm. I mean, I have to say, Blizzard, in my opinion, they once they release Classic, every couple of years they have to re-release it. They—they're going to have to keep delivering on this, otherwise mm-hmm. they're back where they are right now. And mm-hmm. on top of that, when Classic WoW comes out, private server quality increases because now private servers can data mine Classic and get these values. And definitely, Blizzard does not want to cease offering Classic. They, that is a very bad idea. They have to keep right. keep providing it. For sure. For yeah. sure. <clears throat> uh, this question, this is from the brother 420 uh, S fan. What about Bliss Chat integration? Talking to friends, playing other games, they've they've basically all but said that there's going to be uh, BattleNet integrated in, into mm-hmm. into Classic. I mean, that's just kind of like their standard. That's just what they do now. Uh, a, a concern for a lot of people, particularly if you're playing on a PvP server, where uh, you normally you can't make a Horde and Alliance character on the same server uh, if it's a PvP server. So right. That, that's kind of like the, the big concern for a lot of people is if they if they integrate Battle.net the uh, the right way if they do it properly, but they're they're basically going to have uh, they, they basically said that they're going to have Battle.net integration all but said. They basically told us as much at the Blizzard meeting that if they were to implement it that they would have to do it within their larger um, practices as a company as a whole, which is to integrate everything within the Battle.net client and have integration and chat between those. I mean, an extended. It's extended past just Blizzard games at this point. Destiny 2 is on the Battle.net launcher. Call of Duty is now on the Battle.net launcher where you can chat across those different clients. Um, That's just a core part of what the Blizzard and Activision are doing moving forward is creating their own version of Steam, essentially, Mm -hmm. with Battle.net. So um, that's going to exist for sure. Now, to what degree it exists may be a question. and obviously that raises questions about cross-faction collusion, um, which can have implica- in, uh, implications for the famous devil sore farming. It can have imp- implications for uh, PVP, like trying to avoid queuing against another pre-made um, with world bosses. It has a ton-, ton of different things that it could really impact the game. So we'll see see how it does get implemented but i would be surprised if i couldn't message my friend uh playing retail bfa from the classic version i'd be surprised if i couldn't do that Mm -hmm. uh so here's here's another question this is from uh zayas md can you please ask nano about spell batch and whether he thinks it ought to be implemented in classic as far as I understand, it was put in place to help players with lower end PCs compete, but it seems obsolete now. I'm not I'm not quite sure what he means by spell batch. I'm not familiar. Do you know what he could uh, be talking about? Basically the way I understand it is that the server collects um, the spells that you cast and kind of releases them all in a small window. Um, spell queuing? Yeah. Huh. No, so, yeah. But just for people in general, so like if if I cla- uh, cast um, interrupt at the same moment that Polymorph was about to finish casting in the retail version, one of them would go off while the other one wouldn't, but in vanilla they might both go off. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because of the spell batching system where it would you know, kind of group the like spells nearby to and process them all kind of simultaneously. Um, I doubt that it's necessary these days or it will be implemented like that um, in Classic WoW because the technology is there where it's unnecessary. And 
you'll you probably will lose some of the times where two paladins are fighting each other and uh, hammer of justice each other at the same time right. and they'll sit there and, for four seconds staring <laughs> at each other thinking now what um but uh I don't, I don't know how they're gonna implement that we'll probably have to wait until the demo to find out that spell batching and also the the old spell queuing system were gotten rid of um, with patch 4.0, similar to wall jumping, a lot of other changes were made. Mm -hmm. And so like like we said with wall jumping, if they're running off a current WoW client that's retrofitted for classic WoW, I'd be very surprised if these things are there for classic. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. There's a lot of questions I w that we'll have answered when the demo comes. We'll have an idea about what they want to do with graphics, what they want to do with view distance specifically, like that could make a big difference in the way that you play the game, the way you feel about the game. Um, models, kind of the back end mechanics, spell mechanics, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I think one of the things that I, I legitimately think there's going to be people, people upset about this and, and vocally upset about this, probably myself included. I I don't want them to fix moonwalking. Like I, I think moonwalking is something that's <laughs> it's very nostalgic. It's funny to do. Um, yeah. For for people who aren't, I guess, familiar with I, moonwalking, I call it power sliding power sliding yeah like you're basically running in one direction and and if you there's a few ways to do it but basically if you if you try and move the right way your character's facing one way and running backwards and if you walk then it literally looks like he's he's moonwalking so that's that's what uh that's where the term comes from but yeah the chad slide the chad slide yeah. <laughs> I, I i'm i'm still nostalgic for when you try to loot something and it just doesn't work and then you're just in, stuck in the loot animation forever and you're sliding <laughs> around everywhere <laughs> stuck in the loot animation like it's stupid but uh i i love that I yeah love you'll cast a spell and then immediately go back down to your knee i think it's super yeah. funny <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's super funny um I, I think this is a good question this has come up a few times um trill was asking this um how whenever whenever you guys release Nostalrius, because because I didn't play on Nost, but uh, when you guys released Nostalrius, did you guys have uh, did you guys have dynamic respawns, and what was your decision behind that? We did have dynamic respawns. Mm -hmm. um, there's two two systems for dynamic respawns: one for objects in the world and one for uh, mobs in the world. Um, it was a necessity because we had so many players on the server that we had to do some level of dynamic respawning. I don't know if it's a necessity classic WoW because we don't know how they're going to deal with server populations. There's um, consequences to dynamic respawns that are unintended, especially when a server is released and everybody is leveling, mm -hmm. where you can get ahead with a group of people and then because dynamic respawn applies, you can like AOE grind at a significantly faster pace because things keep spawning fast enough for you to keep on killing them. Uh, that seem unintended. And also there's consequences when you're get stuck in a cave and you kill a mob and you go to kill the other mob. And by the time you kill in that second mob, right. the first one respawns yeah. and just get stuck in this endless loop of fighting the same mobs over and over again. Um, if you're an OP class like in Hunter, you probably be okay um <laughs> but if you're a warrior you're gonna you're gonna avoid every quest that sends you into a cave because you just can't kill things fast enough to deal with the dynamic respawn uh, so if if you had to guess how many people can og azeroth no increased static respawn rates or no dynamic respawn rates how many people can og azeroth reasonably accommodate without any changes like that uh <laughs> I don't know. If you uh, uh, okay, I think it'd be so. Hard to say, yeah, it it's it's hard to say because it depends on how you want to deal with end game stuff like Black Lotus. Uh, do you want Black Lotus to be available enough? Ever anybody could reasonably get a flask on any given raid. Um, if you say yes then you probably need to deal with the respawn rate of Black Lotus in some way. Because there's four Black Lotus that spawn every hour in the four zone, like between the four zones. Um, so that's four Black Lotus every hour over the course of a day. That's 20 times four. You have uh, 100 Black Lotus, or 
96 Black Lotus. Um, is that enough to sustain multiple raiding guilds mm -hmm. every week for each of their casters to have a flask every week? Pro probably not. So if you if you don't want if you want people to have a, a reasonable chance to have a flask every week, then you probably need to deal with the respawn rate on Black Lotus. Now, if you don't care about that, uh, and flasks are a luxury item that costs a lot of money that only the most hard people are going to be able to afford any given week, then you probably don't need to deal with dynamic respawns for herbs at all. So th those are things that you have to figure out, like the philosophy behind how you want the game to play before you answer the question, like what should the dynamic respawn be? Mm -hmm. um, we, we decided to have dynamic respawns on herbs, for instance, because there was 12,000 concurrent players, but 100,000 players consistently playing every single week. And so many of those players were raiding, and 96 Lotus every day did not meet the demands that was necessary for that level. Right. So then we just decided that the meta of our server was that raiders were bringing consumables to every raid and so we we designed the dynamic respawn system to fit the current meta of the players because mm. that's what we decided to do but that's not necessarily the right way to do it. right just a way i guess um yeah i i think it'll be really interesting to see and you know just kind of see how whenever this demo comes out how things kind of pan out I, I think the demo is going to be our first, I mean, it's definitely going to be our, our first look at it, but we're going to be able to learn a lot from it. And one of the things that we're going to be able to learn is how we, we might see, I mean, it, it's not done, but we might see how they're thinking about approaching it. Like if there is any sort of sharding or dynamic respawns or anything like that, or if they just hundred percent leave it as it is just for them to like sit back and look and be like, okay, let's see, let's see how things pan out. Uh, right. It could be a sort of stress test really. You know, with, with that many people playing, you've got people at BlizzCon, you have anybody with a virtual ticket, people at home are playing it over the course of a week. I think it could be a really sort of, uh, a, a really good sort of, uh, just stress test is probably the best word for it, to kind of sit back right. and observe and see how things kind of play out. Yeah, I'm excited for the demo because it will answer a lot of questions that, that we're waiting to, to see the answers for. Mm-hmm. For sure. What 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 are the maybe the top three things that you're eager to learn from the demo? Um, one, I want to see what they do from graphical perspective. Um, what options we have for video and graphic and sound interfaces? It, the options that we had in vanilla, or is it the current options? Um, and along with that, the models that they want to go with and the options that we have for those models. Um, so. Is there only the new updated models? Is there only the old optimum, updated, old non-updated models? Or can you go between the two using some sort of toggle? Um, I want to know that. I want to know to what degree, if any, there is dynamic respawning or sharding. Um, I want to have, we probably won't find out from the demo, but I want to have some idea, at least from BlizzCon, how many servers they plan on releasing, I think. Mm -hmm because that will make a... And if they're going to be localized to regions. So is there going to be an international server, which I doubt? Um, will they be US, EU, Oceania-centric servers? Because that's a, that'll be a big difference for a lot of people playing on Nostalrius, is that it was an international group with a lot of Asian players, a lot of European players, and some US players. Um, but going to only U.S. players, only EU players playing together will be a big difference and change the way that, for example, world bosses work uh, extremely. Like if a world boss, if Kazakh spawns at, you know, 10 a.m. U.S. time, we always knew that a Euro group was going to beat it before we were able to rally our people to even try. So it caused right. us to never even try to get people to do world bosses because there was just so many more people that were able to mobilize so much faster given most time spot so why even bother but on mm -hmm. only us player that playing field is now level so we'll see yeah i think the nature of being region uh local servers will also inhibit um 
the Devils Are Mafia a lot because the Devils Are Mafia was really fostered by, okay, the North Americans are asleep, the Europeans take over. Europeans are sleeping now. Uh, they don't sleep very much, but now the Chinese are taking over, right? And so right. there was a global, a global mm -hmm. initiative to lock down resources like that. Right. Yeah. I am. Uh, I don't know how you deal with Devil Swarm Mafia specifically. Um, in general, I dislike the idea, although I uh, admire the effort <laughs> um, because they they spend a lot of time, and it's something that has become kind of like this pet thing for a certain number. of players that like this is the reason why they play wow is to farm devil sore and make like all this gold by artificially capping the supply of devil sore leather i think there are ways that you can fight it without specifically going after those players which is might be more buzz like but changing or varying their spawn points so they don't all spawn in the same spot every single time so you can't you know camp the spawn point because they have patrols, right? We all know that the Devil Swords have patrols. Mm -hmm. Surely they could spawn at various points along those patrols. That would cut down on on the ability for the Devil Sword Mafia to cut to like have full monopoly over every spawn, and also varying their spawn timers and locations uh, would help fight it. I'm against being heavy-handed in fighting against player-made systems because those are dynamic and really cool in the MMO world um, but the cross-faction collusion that comes with it where alliance just don't kill the horde that they're working with because the horde are there to kill other alliance that show up that's really dangerous uh, to be at and against kind of the ideal of the server so I, I don't know how they're going to deal with it mm -hmm. I think that there's interesting ways they can solve it but the cross-faction collusion is it's dangerous mm-hmm yeah, and I, I'm not sure how cross-faction collusion plays out in the TOS, but it would be either way. It'd be very hard to prove if it's happening in Discord, and you know what I mean, if it's if it's off-platform. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can just observe player behavior, and right. see like alliance and horde staying next to each other for hours at a time, and then, but one of those factions is attacking other alliance or horde that are showing up. Um, so. You can just observe player behavior, but it requires a lot of work on the GM side that they're probably not going to want to invest their man hours in. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, so we're, we're going to take a few more questions, maybe a couple more questions here. Uh, but just as a reminder for anybody who missed it earlier, we are doing another giveaway this week. Uh, the giveaway is in the chat right now. If you guys haven't followed myself, tips, and stay safe, then uh, you guys can do that through that giveaway. Uh, and if you have already done it, you just have to go and check the boxes, basically. And uh, you are eligible to win one of three BlizzCon virtual tickets. And you guys can do the uh, do the classic demo. We had one giveaway already. Uh, and we'll be doing three a week. Three last week, three this week, and then uh, three next week as well before BlizzCon. So we'll be doing a total of uh, nine tickets as part of Classic Cast. You guys have been very supportive of us and what we're doing. And it's it's been really, really awesome. So we kind of want to... Uh, now that we actually have our, our first taste of classic, we want to give back to you guys. So uh, the link to that is in the chat right now. For those of you guys watching on YouTube, it's going to be in the comments. Uh, whenever you're watching this, I'll, I'll pin it to the top of the comments. Mm -hmm. So um, let me see if I can scroll back up here. I saw a question here that I liked. Let's see if it disappeared. Um. Uh, debuff slots. What do you want to see with debuff slots? I can guess. <laughs> Eight and sixteen, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I play a warlock, so I wouldn't mind sixteen. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess there's still the remaining question, like, will they limit it to sixteen? Which I think they will. Um, I I don't I don't know about eight. We'll see. Uh, I think it'll be sixteen though. Yeah. So I actually uh, I have a blue post from Eonix from 2006 where basically he explained that the debuff slot limit when they went from 8 to 16 it wasn't a design decision they said very little to do with design and balance it was mostly a technical limitation and then they decided to up to 16 and uh, uh you know eventually it, it went higher than that but i don't know i thought that was really interesting because i think a lot of people a, a lot of people myself included thought it was more of a design design decision um, 
but then no it, it turns out it was more of a technical thing so i think that plus the fact that they're going off of 1.12 is, is just gonna it, it leads me to believe the it leads me to assume that they're probably just gonna go with 16 debuff slots yeah if if they made the decision to not have a debuff one it would really change the way that some classes played maybe for the better um it won't maybe rogues will use uh, their rupture and and other abilities for damage over times um but it, it would impact hunters a lot where they could then use uh serpent sting and warlocks obviously can use multiple dots to increase their damage but the problem is that if you increase the debuff limit then everyone's damage is going to go up yeah and then yeah. they'd have to and, counter it with the damage and health basically you have to counter it with increasing the health and who knows if you get the balance right and it's just going to change the way that each class is played now i don't think that's necessarily bad for hunters because hunters are bad in vanilla in part because serpent sting is not a good as a debuff as other debuffs are so they're not allowed to use it at least in top end guilds which cuts their dps down really badly so it's like kind of like they lose on both ends there uh to the point where you don't even you're not supposed to bring multiple like more than three hunters and hunters is one of the most played classes so then they get kind of shut out from top end rating that's that's a problem but i don't think it's necessarily can be solved in vanilla i don't think that we should go out of our way to solve class balance stuff like that um we should i think we should leave it at 16 and let guilds deal with the 16 debuff women as they would want to deal with mm -hmm. i i personally want eight i think i think even if the reason for only having eight initially was a technical reason the first couple raids in vanilla wow were balanced around eight right they were tuned around that regardless of of the reason why there was eight that's what they were tuned around right I think it would trivialize Molten Core and Nixie's Layer, Black Moon Layer, um, definitely if, if you started off with 16. The other thing, the eight debuffs matter thanks to differences in PvP. It can only have de debuffs on players, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and big right. PvP battles, um, like in Arathi Basin or something like that. Although Arathi Basin did not exist when eight debuffs existed in vanilla. Um, but those big PvP battles, you might have opportunity chances where you could have eight debuffs and then things start falling off because a uh, debuff moment has been reached that, mm -hmm. that would be interesting but, yeah yeah i i think it'll be i think it'll be cool to see how they approach it i i really do think whenever they do go into you know not the demo necessarily but whenever they go into the beta like or an alpha or whatever i think that testing period is actually going to be really really important in terms of them figuring out you know uh, assuming they want to go with 16 debuff slots okay how does this affect kill times do we need to increase the health do we need to increase any sort of damage that the bosses are doing and uh, we mostly talk about rating, but I think that's what most of the nitty gritty of what we're talking about applies to uh, more than the leveling process and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, guys, I think, uh, I think it's about that time. We had a great time here with Nano, uh, who was head of quality assurance for Nostalrius. He was in the meeting with Blizzard whenever they... Uh, they were sharing what they learned with Nostalrius. Stay safe, Tips, who uh, who had to leave. We're we're all very very thankful that uh, that you joined us today, man. That was uh, this is this has been really fun. It was great, dude. Yeah, yeah. I I, I love WoW. I love Classic WoW especially. So anytime I get the chance to chat about it and share a little bit of whatever insight I have, um, I I always enjoy it and. Uh, I said this earlier to you guys off off stream, uh, but I'll say it on stream as well, is that I appreciate uh, all that you guys do. Um, I Streaming and YouTubing and doing what you guys do is, is a lot of work, and you guys have carried the banner for Classic WoW forward, um, and some of you even before you knew that it would be a thing. So now that you guys have been doing this consistently in Classic Cast and your individual streaming, uh, I appreciate it as uh, a consumer of your content, and uh, I'm excited for when Classic releases finally, and you guys can uh, hopefully, you know, uh, your dividends will pay off uh, when Classic comes out and you're you're getting more subs, more followers, 
uh, and uh, at the end of the day that you can support yourselves and your families with what you do. So that means a lot. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, I really real. appreciate it. I'm, I'm tearing up, dude. Thank you very much. I'm... <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, it was great hearing everything. I mean, just, uh, you know, the stuff that we didn't know about seeing how support here and how supportive Ian was. And, uh, you know, like you said, like the brat kind of gets the brunt end of it from the community but right. he was actually much more supportive of classic than than really anybody knows that's really really cool yeah that's big yeah, that's, really really that's cool really cool big news yeah i know a lot of people were worried with him being the new president of blizzard but i i from everything that i've heard he's a very good guy and he's on board with classic and he's helping pushing it forward yep yep i mm -hmm. i agree so uh, i've had a lot of fun uh, being here uh, maybe i'll be back again someday yeah Sounds great. Yeah, thank but you I'll very see, much for coming on, man. I'll we see really you guys probably it. in the hills of Elwyn or uh, Duratar. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What on on the demo? Get in contact with us and let's test some stuff, dude. Let's do it. Okay, huh? that'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be great. That'll be great, guys. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us today, and uh, I'll I'll continue my stream after this. I'll, I'll stream for a little while longer, and uh, I'll see you guys here in a few minutes. Thank you guys so much. Take care, everyone. See ya.